I remember still walking through that door out at Methods and Materials into the courtyard and I just giggled and laughed um, and I was on the verge of tears. Um, it was a huge moment. Um, I was so amazed that we owned the sculpture um, and my eyes immediately fixated on these patches um, that had been done as I sensed immediately in a way that wasn't consistent with the way the sculpture was made, the way the artist wanted the sculpture to be. Then, you know, I saw the eye beams, I saw the moss growing on the sculpture, I saw the cracks, and I feel like the, this weight of the entire sculpture was suddenly on me um, in a way that I knew if I wasn't going to take care of this sculpture, no one would. So once I had sort of become sensitive to what the demands of this particular sculpture were going to be, immediately I thought of Christian Scheidemann. I grew up in Bonn, which was very close to Cologne, and Olf Ostel was very, very present. And the Ruhn der Verkehr, his uh, sister sculpture, was there every time I went to Cologne. Christian, you know, he was kind of like the god for me in terms of someone who knew everything um, there was to know about art made from strange and uh, non-traditional materials. He came soon thereafter and we looked at the sculpture and I still remember, I think within five minutes we were arguing about the muffler underneath the car lying there in the dirt. And he immediately said, you know, we can do this. You know, it's going to be difficult, but we can do this. So much about the early process with the sculpture was about convincing people that this deserved taken care of, that this deserved time, energy, funding. It's exciting when one sees a project like this create opportunities for collaboration across the university. So if you think about it starting as an idea of a faculty member and a few of her students um, that was then supported in part by the Gray Center and then fully by the Neubauer Collegium but then bringing together folks at the Smart Museum and Rockefeller Chapel and the library and Arts and Public Life and the Logan Center. I started having real qualms about what am I allowed to do with this? You know, who gives me license to decide, oh, we're going to fill those cracks. Oh, we're going to take those patches away. It is very rare to deal with an artwork that the artist has never seen and has never approved. And for a conservator, the main question is what is the original? This whole project has been like energized by, perplexed by, a uh, sort of overarching paradox and that paradox develops out of the opposition between understanding this concrete car as a sculpture on the one hand or on the other um, understanding it as the residue of a happening that happened in 1970. I think the workshops were pure desperation on my part. You know, there was a sense I need to do this. I don't know how to do this. The only way to figure out how to do this is ask other people and people who know better. In order to know how to proceed with the conservation, we had to go back and look at the evidence and gather all of the information about how this car was made and about Vostel himself. So we went on these kind of epic uh, research projects. It's an example of Fluxus art, which was a performance-based art movement. And Fostel made this as what he called an event sculpture. It's not about making an artwork, but it's more about the gesture. You can see that in its production, that it's a kind of immediate, you know, a rough mold, the concrete's poured in, the, there's two by, there's evidence of where the two by fours were, and you see the rough aggregate that's not controlled. This was an object that demanded humanistic inquiry. What does the sculpture mean? How does it mean? What are these materials? How do these materials mean? And why do you place it in a city context, urban context, etc.? That, that only got me so far with the sculpture, and especially with the conservation of the sculpture. 
I really needed scientists on this project. I needed people who were material scientists, who knew a lot about concrete. I needed conservators who are working precisely at the intersection of art history and science. After graduate school, I went uh, to the National Air and Space Museum. And so there I worked a lot on space material and spacesuits and aircraft and things that are large and complicated and and somewhat unloved. We knew there was a Cadillac underneath. None of us knew anything about cars, and you know, we knew we had to find a car specialist. It's hard for me to quantify the the effects of just sitting under, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16 tons of, of concrete, uh, and uh, you know, establish what happens uh, in the intervening 40 years. We knew we needed a Cadillac specialist, and we knew we needed a con concrete specialist, and the concrete specialists that we had um, were coming more from the sort of structural engineering side, but we really needed someone who knew about concrete and art together. Concrete is a, you know, basically a manufactured product. Um, it's a binder and it's an aggregate and you always need to, before you start working on it, you should always test it to find out actually what its components are. We reached out to Amanda and she came out and was telling us everything that we all wanted to know about concrete in general, but about this concrete and what had happened to the cracks and why they had happened and why this concrete looked the way that it looked. The identification of the composition was through petrography and then the petrography also includes a carbonation test and then um, chemical analysis which identified chlorides. Those would have been used for uh, a cure accelerant for a pour in the middle of winter. Those were sort of aspects of the concrete that spoke to sort of its potential self-destruction, really. So these workshops kind of grew and grew and grew um, early on, first, second, third, with really sort of, you know, 20, 30, eventually probably like 40 people in the room crammed in there, um, trying to give some structure to our conversations. There were so many different people involved that had different ways of understanding the sculpture, different ways of conserving or doing art historical research. Structural engineers, art historians, university landscaper, um, project managers for the university, me, students. I think a big challenge was making sure everyone was on the same page. I was, I was very invested in the patch discussion and I was very against doing anything with the patches. Um, not the patches should stay. We learned that the sculpture was patched in several substantially large areas like this one in 1970, soon after the sculpture was made. Do you know anything about uh, the first set of patches? Oh, I know that the windows caved in and uh, it was patched. I don't know if Jim did the patching. These I don't remember. Like this, this one right, this one that runs all the way across the entire front. I don't remember that. Patch failures were introducing water um, through them and it was just sitting and getting trapped between the plane of the original concrete and the new concrete. So I was uncovering all these sort of um, like rotten pockets of concrete. So Amanda had to develop a compound that matched in color, matched in terms of the aggregate, the kinds of stones that are in the concrete, that matched in terms of texture, and that also matched in terms of the shape of the sculpture. Is decay implied in Fastel's work? Is the rust part of the original, or can it be removed? What about the air and the tires? The body can't be counted on to, to not keep corroding. And if we, if we have it support the weight of the whole structure, um, <laughs> it will eventually fail. Some of the treatments that we applied were a tannic acid solution to treat metal corrosion and we applied a microcrystalline wax over that. There was rubber elements, the tires. They were very lightly cleaned with deionized water. We replaced a exhaust hanger. Somebody in the car's original useful life had used household electrical wires. So we were directed to replace that with electrical wire that we sourced. One of the most difficult aspects of the conservation project became the stabilization of the sculpture. It was fascinating to listen to the debates that the engineers were having, or to be in those debates. I think that this has been happening primarily because of this. 
yeah. these I beams um, that were underneath, uh, clearly placed there to support the sculpture, but clearly so obtrusive visually in a way that I just knew they didn't belong there. And then we had to figure out what was there. How could we support the sculpture? So the frame of the car that we assembled it looks like a, uh, a hashtag. We had said it has to be minimally visible, but that actually proved very, very challenging. And by doing that, we were able to get enough flexibility within the frame that we were gonna able to control the loads to the garage and get a pretty even distribution. Because of the way that this garage is structured, we really had to put our pressure points on very specific locations. And so a lot of the challenge was drawing up something that we thought was aesthetically pleasing, that also was able to hold the sculpture in a structurally stable way. And so bringing it back, understanding that it had to become a public sculpture again, that in some sense became the most fundamental aspect of the conservation project. It was the right site for so many different reasons. It could be where a real car can be, it's the last in a line of parked cars. It is where traffic flows. Cars are driving in and out right next to the sculpture. And yet, it is also perfect from a conservation point of view. What triggers the chlorides, the deterioration due to the chlorides, is oxygen and water. So by putting it in the garage, we actually maintain the idea of public sculpture outside, which is what it was it's an original intention, but we also gain some coverage of it. It is perfectly protected and yet it is art historically perfectly placed. It's perfect. It's hard to say why such a silly kind of dumb thing as covering a car in concrete is so exciting, but um, it is and has been for me from the get-go. It is an artwork that really is about getting people to walk by not even realizing they're walking by art, seeing it out of the corner of the eye and going, whoa, what's that? I think you can be intrigued, I think you can be challenged, and you, I could imagine people being angry. It's like, really? You're using up a parking space? That's one issue. Um, and then, really? Uh, at a university like this, you would allow um, this kind of art to have such prominence? And I think exactly, because um, it's, it's the kind of art that really does take thinking. Why is so much of our world made out of concrete? And what does concrete mean? To take the concrete and put it together with the car is unexpected, not what either was designed for. And yet, when you do that, you open up conversation about the possibilities that are inherent in all of the things around us that we don't think about generally. Concrete traffic, the sculpture, and then concrete happenings, the project, has been an exciting moment to use an individual work of art that clearly has inspired incredible passion among our faculty and students, but also raises really interesting questions about what is art and allows us to celebrate the importance of objects and of public art.